Welcome. So the first lecture we're going to do in Unit 1.1 is a discussion of what is physics. So physics is one of the most fundamental natural sciences. It looks at the connections between the very atoms in our universe and the forces that act on the universe as a whole and everything in between. So physics is an understanding of the natural world. It's an understanding of the forces, of the energy, of the motion of objects in our universe. The physics itself um, is a heavily mathematical language. So it requires a strong underpinning of algebra or in a more advanced physics calculus to really do physics well. In this course, we'll be limiting ourselves to algebra and a little bit of trigonometry. But even with those math tools, we'll be able to get an under lying sense of how objects work in the universe. The goal of the course this semester will be to talk about the motion of objects, dealing with kinematics, the study of how objects move, dynamics, the study of what makes object move, objects move, forces, rotational motion, momentum, energy, um, wave motion, and then some thermodynamics. So that's the goal of this course this semester. So physics is all around us, right? Engineering relies heavily on physics. So anything that's engineered from the smallest microchip and electron scanning microscopes to the largest buildings relies on an understanding of how physics works. Without physics, you cannot build the computer. Without physics, you cannot build a house. You cannot build, or at least not a very efficient house. You cannot build skyscrapers. You cannot build long bridges. You can't build space stations. You wouldn't have a GPS satellite system. Microwave ovens wouldn't exist. Um, any type of medical advancement um, for sonograms, the idea of the MRI machines or CAT scans, even simple x-ray machines wouldn't understand, wouldn't work without an understanding of physics. So physics is all around us. And understanding physics allows us to understand how, at least in principle, how these devices work. So physics is a natural science. It is probably the, again, the most fundamental natural science. And all sciences rely on a method called the scientific method. The scientific method is a way of understanding the world around us. Uh, in terms that Neil deGrasse Tyson has famously put it, it's a way of not fooling ourselves. It's a way of studying the universe and relying on observation, relying on logic, skepticism, and logical analysis. Scientific method has a couple of terms that are very popular with scientific method. You have a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an educated guess would be a good way of doing it. It's an idea. It's, hey, if we do this, that might happen. It's a way of coming up with a, a means of testing the world around us. And hypotheses have to be testable. If a hypothesis is not testable, it is not science. Now, hypotheses usually come about after observing something. Observation is critical in science. We need to observe the world around us and to, to create these hypotheses. Once the hypothesis is confirmed by the evidence or it is rejected by the evidence, then this begins the process of the scientific method. If a hypothesis is confirmed, then great. If it's rejected, then we look for an alternate hypothesis. We do not select data that fits our hypothesis, our hypothesis has to explain the data, it has, to, it has to explain the observations, that's science. Now, some hypotheses can be written as simple mathematical functions, which we call laws. A scientific law is not the end result of the scientific method. A law is not inviolate. 
a law is usually reserved for a hypothesis that can be resent that can be cast as a simple equation. For example, Kepler's third law of planetary motion is a simple relationship p squared is equal to a cubed. Newton's law of gravity will learn. Force of gravity is equal to some gravitational constant times the product of two masses over the distance squared. That is Newton's law of gravity. Newton's second law of motion, a force on an object is equal to the, the mass of the object times that object's acceleration. Newton's second law of motion. These laws are basically rules in physics that can, can be represented as simple equations. Now, the law of gravity is actually wrong. Too close to a black hole, this law breaks down. But since it works for 99.999% of the situations we're going to use it in, it's still considered a law. So a law doesn't mean it can't be broken. Like I said, the law of gravity actually doesn't work when you're near a black hole, for instance, or near a massive object like the sun. But it works for most situations. The most important bit and the end result of a scientific method is a theory. Now, theory is tricky because some people may incorrectly use the colloquial idea of theory, which is, oh, I have a theory, right? Sherlock Holmes has a theory as who, who uh, did the crime. That's not how theory is used in scientific circles. Theory in science is a well-studied, well-supported um, collection of ideas that cannot be re represented as a single mathematical equation like a law is. For example, Einstein's theory of relativity. Einstein's theory of relativity has many, many predictions in it, one being the famous E equals mc squared. But there are other equations in that theory. So there is no, Einstein is not a law of relativity, not because it hasn't been proven, it's been shown to be correct for the last 100 years, every test we've thrown at it. But it cannot be represented as a simple mathematical equation, therefore it is not considered a law. But it is the best we can do in, in, in science, it is a theory. The theory of evolution is well supported. It's not a theory because Scientists aren't sure if it works. It's a theory because it has mountains of evidence supporting it, but it can't be reduced down to a single mathematical equation that would make it a law of evolution. So theory doesn't become a law once it's proven. That's not how science works. A law is a hypothesis that could be re represented as a simple mathematical equation. A theory is a collection of hypotheses, a collection of arguments, of observations that support it, that supports itself. Now, physics is actually broken up into two major parts, and we'll be working on classical physics for all sem this semester and most of next semester. Around 1900, a, that's around the dividing time, physics was thought to be largely done, that most people understood the laws of physics, the laws of motion, the laws of, of thermodynamics, of optics, and there was just a little bit of cleaning up that needed to be done but most of physics was understood. But there were a couple of problems that bothered physicists, and it wasn't until those problems were really picked away at that it revealed that we didn't know as much as we thought we did. So before 1900, Newton and Kepler and all of the scientists you've heard about in, in the ancient past, um, though, that's classical physics. After 1900, relativity and quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr and Schrodinger and Albert Einstein, that's modern physics. So we're getting into modern physics, which is only 100 years old, a little bit, a little over 100 years old, a little bit later next sem semester in Physics 142. Physics 141 will focus on a portion of classical physics. So that's it for this discussion. We'll talk about uh, significant figures and quantities in units um, in the next lecture.